Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've been having one of those periods of time all of us astrophotographers do where nothing seems to go right. So what do you do when that happens? You make a video. Let's get started. All right, this has been a saga of taking flats, lots of flats, flats this way, flats that way. Why am I taking flats? Because my lens keeps doing over, and that has never happened before. I'm using my ED-102, so it's a smaller area of glass. It's not my SCT. And yet I'm having problems or had been having problems for two days in a row or two nights in a row where the dew would stop all the imaging and ruin my images. So what was going on? Now, this is a plot from the Ultimate PowerBot software that shows the temperature and the dew point. And you can see that when the dew point reaches the temperature, which is right around here, about four hours or so into this particular imaging night, you better be prepared to deal with dew. And I just was wondering why it was my dew strap wasn't working anymore until I noticed, oh, plugged it into the wrong port. Yeah, whenever I move my stuff from one telescope, for example, the Red Cat 51, over to the ED-102, I do need to take a little more care and make sure that my dew heater plug is plugged into port A. Instead, for the first two nights anyway, I had it plugged into port C. So I was going out there trying to do imaging without a dew strap. And I did prove something to myself, a question that I've always had. Do I really need a dew strap on my refractors that have a long dew shield? But I wanted to go a little further and do another test just to see how much heat the dew strap was providing. Because when I've touched it and it's been operating, I don't feel like it's that hot. So I did a little experiment here. I've got my temperature data logger back inside the dew shield pressed up against the lens. The back end of the dew strap is more or less even with the front end of the lens here. So this is the front end of the dew strap is hanging out forward of that. And that would put the temperature data logger basically directly above the dew strap. And then I did a little experiment where I ramped up the power in several increments over a period of about an hour and a half to two hours and recorded the temperature inside the dew shield next to the lens. And it's actually pretty effective. The do not dew strap is increasing the temperature of the air just in front of the lens by almost five degrees C here in this test. It's a pretty good difference in temperature. And yes, it is absolutely essential to have that present and working on those nights where dew was a big problem. So I didn't mean to do the experiment, but I did, and I'm going to try not to do that experiment ever again. So once I got all of my dew issues figured out, I could actually take some data and keep it, and now I need to have flats. So I need to retake flats because after each night I was doing over and that left residue, so I cleaned the residue off and retook the flats. I did that a couple of nights, and now finally I'm getting some good images, so I'm on my way. But I thought I'd share with you the process I go through to take flats. This is the room where I watch all of my sports teams lose, as they just did recently. And it's the media room, so there are no windows. I can put the telescope here on a table and turn off the lights, close the door, and it's a nice dark room with no uh, extraneous light that can get in through the back of the telescope. Now, when it's set up here, I'm using my Pegasus Astro flat panel, and I took a number of flats here, experimenting with different things with the flat panel pressed up against the dew shield with the flat panel offset a couple of inches, two to six inches away from the dew shield with the dew shield extended as it is here and the dew shield retracted. So that's how I'm taking these flats. Now you'd think with having the dew issue settled, a new whole new round of flats, including new darks, new dark flats, new flats, that all of my problems would be solved. Not so much. This is what I'm finally getting now that I have data. I'm getting a, uh, a very prominent off-axis guider shadow here. Now you see it in both areas here because I'm taking uh, images of M81 and M82 on both sides of the meridian. I can take this image and do a dynamic background extraction on it by just peppering uh, sample points back in these dark areas here and all throughout this uh, brighter zone in the middle. And when I do that, I get this. Now, it's sort of taken care of my problem in the corners with the non-calibrated off-axis guider shadow, but now what it's doing is pulling out enough of the noise in here so that I can see these circular artifacts that I have seen before. And in fact, I did a video on this and had assumed at the time that this was reflections of light 
leaking into the system, reflecting off of the filters and the filter wheel, and it was causing these multiple uh, circular reflections around. And that's what led me to start taking flats in a dark room. And that did help. I didn't totally eliminate the problem, but it did reduce its severity. Now that I'm seeing this again, I want to come back and do some more thinking about this. So even though I'm getting good data, I still have some flats issues to take care of. The off-axis skyder shadow is maybe the most concerning. And then the circle reflections that we'll take a look at here. Since I'm in the mode of taking a lot of flats and experimenting with different things, one of the issues I wanted to take on was this commandment that's been hanging out there in forums and astrophotography, which is thou shalt take flats with exposure times greater than two seconds. I don't know where that came from. I never hear of any rationale behind that. I've always taken flats with luminance exposure times, and for that matter, red, green, and blue exposure times less than two seconds. What you're looking at is the flat panel as seen by the cloud cam that I use for tracking clouds during a night of imaging, and it's just staring at the flat panel back here. And you can see some horizontal lines here that correspond to an exposure time of five milliseconds. You definitely want to have an exposure time for your flats that allows this refresh banding to average out over the course of a single exposure. Now, I've been using 0.3 seconds for the luminance filter, something between one second and two seconds for my RGB filters. And I don't have any issues, but you might want to keep track of this feature here, if you're using a flat panel, what is its refresh rate? And make sure that you are picking flats with an exposure time that lets that refresh banding average out. Fortunately, I've got some help in dealing with this issue. It turns out Terry Fitzpatrick, a viewer to this channel, also performed an experiment with his equipment. He did a master flat where he had exposures for his flats of 0.5 seconds and another master flat where he used an exposure time of 10 seconds and created two master flats. And then he took one of these master flats and tried to calibrate it against the other master flat to see what you would get. Now, in the ideal world, these two flats are equivalent. What you should see is a flat field. This vignetting we're seeing in both of his flat images should disappear and you get a flat field. Let's take a look at what he got when he did that. He got a very flat field. If you will go through in PixInsight and just pick off points around here in the corners where you get the vignetting, compare it to the, uh, the level here in the middle where you don't have any vignetting, you find that you get pretty much a little statistical variation, but it's basically the same set of values across this field. So this is a very flat field, and he proves with his equipment that a 0.5 second exposure time for flats is perfectly fine. That brings us to one of my problems that's been around for a while, and that's these embossed looking circles that appear in the field. And it's almost certainly due to my filter wheel and some reflections off the filter wheels. And you're getting this embossed effect because apparently the filter wheel is in one position when it moves in a clockwise direction and a slightly rotated position when you approach that same filter from a different direction. And then that's what leads to this little embossed looking effect what we're seeing here where it overcorrects over here and undercorrects over here. It, with my current setup and the way I've been using this filter wheel, I just have it use bi-directional movement where it just goes to the commanded filter in the shortest possible time. So for example, if I tell it to go to filter number eight and then tell it to go to the luminance filter at filter number one, then it will move in a clockwise direction and I can create a master flat that represents the clockwise direction of the wheel. Likewise, I can have the wheel move to the second position, then command it to move back to the luminous filter, and it will have moved in the counterclockwise direction, and I get a separate master flat. Now we can do the same thing that Terry did and try to calibrate one of these master flats with the other master flat to see if, in fact, it calibrates all these features out. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to calibrate the clockwise master flat with the counterclockwise master flat, and when we do this, Voila, we see circles. Now, we did a pretty good job with the off-axis guider shadow, so I'm not seeing any effect of that. That's good news. I didn't expect to. But we are seeing these, this embossed effect when I try to calibrate a clockwise master flat with a counterclockwise master flat. It confirms that it is the filter wheel, and it does confirm the filter wheel is not going back to the same location when it approaches that location from the clockwise direction 
versus the counterclockwise direction. But let's go ahead and test that out. You go into the driver here with your, in my case, the ZWO filter wheel, click here. So the way I've been using the filter wheel, this has been unchecked. I'm gonna check this now. And now the filter wheel will always move in the same direction. And I create a master flat associated with this particular setting. And now I have the unidirectional master flat and I can use that to calibrate both of the counterclockwise flat and the clockwise flat we were just looking at. When I apply this unidirectional flat to calibrate the clockwise flat, I get a flat field. I don't see the circle features anymore, and of course I don't see the off-axis guider. But when I use the unidirectional flat to try to calibrate the counterclockwise flat, I get this. I get those circles again. The unidirectional motion of the filter wheel corresponds to the clockwise motion of the filter wheel. So my recommendation is if you're using a filter wheel, just go ahead and check the check mark in whatever driver that corresponds to your filter wheel. Go with a unidirectional setting so that you don't have this little error creeping into your flats. And that'll help to remove some of these artifacts that we get in our flats. Now, what about that off-axis guider shadow? It's certainly very prominent here in a single uncalibrated subframe. Now, when I calibrate the frame, this is what I get. And it actually looks like a very flat frame. I don't see the circles and I don't see the off-axis guider shadow. But when I combine all of these images together in one stacked images, over a thousand images, I get this. And so clearly, even though it looks like I've solved the problem back here and I have no issue, the flat is doing something. It's doing quite a bit. When you end up adding all of these subframes together, you still get that effect. So apparently the flats that I have are doing a 99% good job, but they're not doing a 100% good job. And for whatever reason, I'm still left with this off-axis guide or shadow. I've always wondered if I really needed that dew strap on my refractors. They have a nice long dew shield. The area of glass is much smaller. And I've always wondered if perhaps the dew shield was sufficient to get through a night of imaging without having a dew problem. I didn't mean to perform this experiment, found that, yeah, you need your dew strap. You really need the heat coming off of that dew strap, and it does produce a decent bit of heated air in front of that lens. In my case, I did a little experiment and found it's about a five degree delta above the ambient air temperatures. Once I started getting some good data, I found that my flats weren't working again. I was having issues with my L, R, G, and B filters. I'm seeing the off-axis guider shadow and I'm seeing reflection circles in my images. So that led to a series of taking flats and performing experiments. One of the issues I wanted to address was flats should be taken with exposure times greater than two seconds. I have not found it to be true for my equipment. And thanks to Terry Fitzpatrick, he also performed that experiment with his equipment and found that his 0.5 second master flat was essentially equivalent to his 10 second master flat. The circular 3D like artifacts occur when you're using a filter wheel and the filters don't go back to the same position when you're taking flats versus when you're taking lights. And so if there's a little smudge on a filter or the rim of the filter itself, it's creating a reflection or a shadow, you're going to get these circular artifacts in your calibrated images. The big thing you want to do, and I really recommend you do this if you're not already, is use your driver for your filter wheel. Go into that driver, select the unidirectional option if you have it, and that way your filter will always be approaching a selected filter from the same direction, and you'll get the repeatability of the positioning that will allow you to calibrate out those reflections and smudges on individual filters. Now, I have no idea how to solve my off-axis guide or shadow problem. I, the only thing that I can think of is that the lighting conditions for this particular DSO are different from the lighting conditions that I have when I'm taking flats. Next time I'm out under a clear sky, I'll be shooting a different DSO in a different part of sky. So we'll see if this calibration problem in the off-axis guide or shadow continues. Okay, guys, well, that's all I've got for today. Just working on mysteries without any clues. It's always something. I'll see you next time.